This episode of The Nocturnist is supported by Pattern. Shopping for disability insurance is complicated and takes way too much time to research and understand. Pattern simplifies disability insurance for busy doctors with their simple online process. You can request your quotes, compare only the recommended options for doctors, and buy risk-free. Get started today by requesting your free quotes at patternlife.com backslash nocturnists and be confident you have the right policy and that your income is protected with pattern. At The Nocturnist, we are careful to ensure that all stories comply with healthcare privacy laws. Details may have been changed to ensure patient confidentiality. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. Support for The Nocturnist comes from the California Medical Association and the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Being trusted. That's what we want as doctors, for our patients to feel safe, like they're in good hands with us. But sometimes the trust of our patients is overwhelming and even scary. This is The Nocturnists, stories from the world of medicine. I'm Emily Silverman. Today, I speak with Bobby Chong, an interventional radiologist and chair of radiology at the St. Barnabas Hospital Health System in the Bronx. He's a native of Southern California, but has long since acclimated to the New York City way of life. When not being a doctor, Bobby is usually out dancing, riding his motorcycle, or practicing jujitsu. Before we chat with Bobby, we're gonna hear the story that he told live at the Nocturnus in New York City, all the way back in December, 2019. Here's Bobby. See one. Do one, teach one. That's the time-honored way that medical procedures are taught, and this is how I had to do all three on the same day. My patient was Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones had lung cancer, and he was starting to notice his face was swelling. His uh, veins were popping up on his neck, and he was starting to have trouble breathing. He was having trouble eating and laying down. So he came into the hospital, and he was diagnosed with SVC syndrome. So the SVC, the superior vena cava, that's the major vein that drains the blood from the head and the arms. And his was blocked by the cancer. So his doctors called on me to see if there was anything I could do to help. So the first step is I always go and I meet the patient. And I explain to him the risks and the benefits of a procedure I could do. I could do a venogram and I could possibly get through that obstructed vein and open a channel and put in a stent. And of course, there's risks and benefits, and I explained to him the risks and benefits of the procedure. And he signed the consent, said he understood, and he said, do what you gotta do, doc. So we set up the procedure for the next day. He came to the radiology department, and my patients are generally awake from my procedures. They get a little bit of sedation, and I explain, okay, we're gonna clean your neck, and we're gonna prep, drape the area. You'll feel a stick and a burn, this local numbing, and put a needle into the vein, put a wire through that needle, put a catheter over the wire, and I'm in the jugular vein. So now I can get to work trying to get through the SVC. I have a glide wire, and the glide wire is a very slippery wire that's kind of a workhorse for this, and I'm working with the glide wire. I feel a, a little pop, a little give. Mr. Jones, all right, I think, I think we're through this obstruction. I have to put up a balloon now and you know you may feel a little discomfort just let me know put up the balloon he does fine I take down the balloon and Mr. Jones says I don't feel so good and he says I can't breathe and then I haven't seen this often but then I see him die so he's limp the life goes from his face I look at the monitor of his EKG activity still, still going on. I, I feel his neck. I, he's got no pulse. Shaji, call team one. Team one's the highest call for help in my hospital. So first step, at a code, check your own pulse. Go back to the basics. Okay, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. He's not breathing. He's got no circulation. I start, start chest compressions. Finally, the code team shows up. Um, Dr. Smith is there. He's the new ICU attending. 
and they take over compressions, they start giving medications, and I'm, I'm numb. So, what happened? All right, there's electrical activity, he's got no pulse, there's pulseless electrical activity, it's PEA arrest, okay, I know PEA arrest. The H's and T's, what are the H's and T's? H's and T's, not the H, um, hypovolemia, he didn't lose blood all of a sudden, hypokalemia, his electrolytes didn't change, hypothermia, he's not cold. Um, T's, what are the T's? Tension, tension pneumothorax, I just had a fluoroscopy on his chest, his lungs are up, tamponade, could this be tamponade? I grabbed the ultrasound machine, I put it on his chest, I see his heart struggling to beat, there's an echogenic rim around the heart, it's, it's tamponade. And I know the treatment for tamponade. It's a pericardial drain. Only I've never done a pericardial drain. This seems like a bad time to say that out loud. So <laughs> instead I say, Dr. Smith, um, pericardial tamponade, we need to do a pericardial drain. Can you help me with this procedure? Dr. Smith says, okay. We gather up the needle, the wire, the catheter, splash some beta down on Mr. Jones' chest. I put the ultrasound on his heart, I land that needle right to that pericardial fluid. Dr. Smith, can you feed this wire through the needle for me? Thank you. Take off this needle, safety it. Can you just load this 10 French pigtail? You load the drain onto the wire, I feed the drain off, perfect loop. And I've done my pericardial drain, only nothing's draining. So now I have to troubleshoot. It's blood, could it be clotted? I know, I know, the, I know how to treat blood clots. Um, Shaji, mix me alteplase please, eight milligrams. Alteplase is what we give for clots in the lungs, clots in the legs, clots in catheters. This should work. Shaji makes me the alteplase, I put it through the drain and nothing, I kind of irrigate back and forth and I feel a give and, and, and dark melted blood clots start coming out. I connect it to a drainage bag. The drain's draining. Pulse check. So they check his pulse. Pulse is back. He has a breathing tube at this point. He's on a ventilator. He's got his airway. He's got his breathing. He's got his circulation. And, and he's stable enough to go back to the, to the ICU. So the code team takes him up. And it's just me and Dr. Smith. And after a code like that, it's, it's a wreck, you know. It's boxes from the medications that they've been given, wrappers from the catheters, blood, betadine, gowns, gloves. And Dr. Smith says, that was really smooth. You must have placed a lot of pericardial drains. <laughs> that was my first one. And he gives me a look and a pat on the back. And, he goes up to the ICU to take care of the ICU and take care of Mr. Jones. The next day, they extubate him. They take out his breathing tube. Day after that, they take out the pericardial drain. And he still has the blocked SVC. He still has swollen face. He has veins on his neck that shouldn't be there. He still can't lay flat. And I still need to do my procedure. And as the first part of my procedure, I need to go and get informed consent. So uh, I go up, and, and now he's all too aware of the risks. Um, but I tell him the risks and the benefits anyways. And he still trusts me, and he still signs the consent. And, and at this point, I, what I want to say is I'm sorry. I'm sorry the procedure didn't work the first time. I'm sorry you're in this ICU now. I'm sorry you have SVC syndrome. I'm sorry you have lung cancer. But I can't say that. So I set up the procedure for the next day. And he comes to the radiology department. We prep and drape the neck, lidocaine, feel a stick in a burn, needle, wire, catheter. Feel my glide wire get through, put up the balloon slowly. Take down the balloon slowly. Blood's flowing to where it needs to go. Use a slightly bigger balloon. Put in the stent. This time, procedure goes like clockwork. And he leaves the radiology department doing great. 
goes home after a couple of days and I don't see him until he comes back to my clinic in a couple of weeks. So he's in my clinic and I see his face. I see he's better. And I see my procedure worked. And it scared me, the fact that he trusted me just because I'm the doctor and trusted me twice. But seeing his face, seeing that he was himself again, he could eat, he could breathe, he could lay down flat. I had to believe that I was in that room with Mr. Jones for a reason, that I deserved to be there. Even if I don't know how to do every procedure, I need to trust myself that I can take care of my patients. And that's how I learned how to place a pericardial drain. sitting here with Bobby Chong. Bobby, thank you for being with me today. Thank you for having me. So the last time I saw you in person, we were in a packed room in New York City in December 2019. And since then, a lot has happened. I know COVID hit your community really, really hard. So I just wanted to ask, how are you doing now? It's definitely not uh, what it was in March and April of 2020. Uh, that time was, uh, it was hard to think about, and it's, some, it's a time that I try to, you know, give it a place, and I don't want to completely bury it. It happened. Uh, it's hard to believe that it actually happened. You know, the cases are down. We, I think we have less than uh, 15 cases in the hospital right now. It's a far cry from when every inch of this hospital <laughs> Uh, the waiting rooms, the clinic rooms where, where ICUs. I know we're still in a pandemic, but, you know, there's levels of pandemic. And, and that March, April of, of 2020 uh, in New York City, uh, I'm glad that part's over. And I'm wondering, as you think back to the story that you told all those months ago, I guess now years ago, is there anything about the pandemic or COVID that change the way you think about that story or affected it? I think the part I think about the most from that story is trusting myself to do the right thing. During the pandemic, it was a lot of do what you have to do. We were just making really difficult decisions without a lot of resources. And just to be able to trust myself that I may not like it, but I am actually the guy who knows how to triage these things that I need to do. And I'm just going to have to do it. And that's what it is. Yeah, you talk a lot about self-trust toward the end of the story. And I imagine that these experiences before COVID during medical, quote unquote, peacetime, <laughs> might have in some way prepared you for the uncertainty of the pandemic and having to trust yourself in those moments where it was unclear what should be done. How do you summon that feeling of self-trust in a time of chaos? My favorite movie is As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. And there's a line in that movie I really like and I think about and the line is, there's nothing that makes you feel at home like having no choice. It's those times that you just don't have a choice and you have to pick a direction. And this is the direction you're going in. And you may find out that we have to change it a little bit, but you have to trust your best instinct. So it's great when you can look to a playbook or you can look to someone who's been there before. But in the situation of my story, I was the guy in the room that knew the best how to do what needed to be done. And during the pandemic, 
I was the guy in the room that knew best what needed to be done because it was a completely novel pandemic. So kind of no choice forces me to be brave. I want to talk a little bit about your craft, interventional radiology. I am an internal medicine doctor and I never really liked procedures. I'm much more comfortable like in my mind. (laughs) And for me, doing procedures on patients breaking skin, using needles. It always made me uncomfortable. I never felt confident with it. But interventional radiology is very much a field of doing, and it's very tactile. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of becoming an interventional radiologist and and how you learn that craft, how you develop it and build it. I think you've touched on something I'm very passionate and ready to talk about because I love interventional radiology and it's such a shame that nobody knows what it is. And it's such a shame that it's even hard to explain. Manual dexterity is, is very important. I tell people all the time that it's almost like I play video games for a living. I look at a screen, I have something in my hands, and based on very precise movements I have to do with those hands, it changes the outcome of what happens on the screen. It's just happens to be very, very high stakes. So I always tell people that want to be good at procedures to develop your left hand. Sometimes I tell them to write the infinity sign with their left hand. I can write with both hands. I play drums, play video games. I used to do a lot of close-up magic. So I'm just always kind of doing things with my hands, which is a very important part of interventional radiology. And then the other thing I love about interventional radiology is, again, kind of always feel strange about saying this out loud, but so little of what we do, you can learn in a book. And so little of what we do is evidence-based. And so much of what we do can't really be studied because every interventional radiologist does things their own way. And I remember I was at a SIR, the Society for Interventional Radiology Conference, And I remember somebody said that if you do a procedure the same way twice, that's a waste. You always have to get better. You always have to refine. And I remember I was doing a pick line on a patient, and he was so impressed just with the way I moved and the way everything flowed. He said, oh, man, you're like one of those pizza guys. Like DeFerra's in Brooklyn, there's just these guys that just make pizzas all day, every day, and they just refine their technique. It seems like the same thing over and over again, but in actuality, you're just getting a little bit better every day, a little bit better every day. And so much of interventional radiology, it's like needle, wire, catheter. Like in my story, it was needle, wire, catheter. But you can do so much with a needle, a wire, and a catheter. It's it's amazing. Or it's like Taco Bell. You know how Taco Bell keeps coming with new stuff, but it's all the same 10 ingredients? <laughs> You know, it's like we have needles, wires, catheters, we got some balloons, we got some stents, but we can do amazing, amazing things. And the other thing about interventional radiology is so much is off label. We may have the stent that is a tracheobiliary stent, but we put it in a vein or it's a angioplasty balloon. You can use that to open a tract for a gastrostomy balloon. But I just feel it's such a great place for just being able to make up these new techniques. And like I said, you can't learn it in books. During the pandemic, I was so sad that uh, the local NGO clubs were shut down because that's one of my favorite things. Is we, we go and we meet with the local IR guys and we trade all these techniques. And it's amazing. I, I love the field very much. I don't know if you can tell. No, I love it. I love to hear your enthusiasm. And I'm also just fascinated by... These gatherings you're describing where you're all sitting around swapping stories. I mean, can you bring us into that a little bit? What's an example of a story that somebody might share at a gathering? When you get dialysis, you can have an AV fistula or an AV graft. When there's a stenosis upstream from where you uh, puncture the fistula, If that gets stenotic, you can have persistent bleeding, and these bleeds can be pretty bad. So a lot of times you can put a suture, but the problem is a suture, if you tie it down, it'll be hard to dig the knot out later. And someone discovered that you can take a flow switch, which is a a switch that goes on a catheter and that has a little click. You can click it on or off. You can cinch that down on the suture and use that until you get hemostasis, until the bleeding stops, and then you can undo that. And I was like, wow. 
how do you think to put a flow switch on the suture? So that's the one I heard recently that kind of blew my mind. And you talk about how there isn't a lot of evidence behind these things. And I'm wondering, is this how the knowledge is passed down? Is it much more like an apprenticeship or like a guild where, like you said, there's these sort of backdoor gatherings where people are swapping stories or do people, do they publish on this? Is there like a paper in the Journal of Interventional Radiology about using the flow switch on the suture or is there like an online hub where people can throw up their suggestions or how does this knowledge get passed down? SIR has a yearly meeting where we get to learn a lot and they have something called uh, Extreme IR where they uh, show, I hate to use the word cowboy, but cowboy-ish cases. And then now post-pandemic, the SIR has an online angio club. I still enjoy more the gathering with actual people. Twitter, I learn a ton from, you know, shout out to, to the Twitter group chat. I don't know if that's a secret, but if it is, then forget what I said. So there are definitely basics that you have to learn in IR. Put in a port, put in a pick, do a biopsy, do an embolization. But then they're kind of more fancy ways to, to solve problems. story, what your patient needs is a pericardial drain. And you've never placed a pericardial drain before. And so I remember sitting in the audience and thinking to myself, like, oh my God, I can't believe that this is going to be his first time. Like he's going to do this procedure for the first time under these life-threatening circumstances. And that's so stressful. But now hearing you talk about the Taco Bell analogy... I'm wondering like, huh, I mean, definitely still sounds like a scary thing, but is placing a pericardial drain actually that different from placing a drain, say, in another part of the body or like how different was it? Yeah, the technique is the same. It's like it's needle, wire, catheter. So like doing a nephrostomy uh, for an obstructed kidney, doing a cholecystostomy for cholecystitis, um, doing just a parapendiceal or a diverticular abscess drain. The drain actually wasn't working at first. So what I did was I put TPA into the drain. Is that just going to make him bleed out into his mediastinum? But no, I TPA'd the drain and I got to take the pericardial blood out. I've actually never heard of that before or since. I, I showed that at my NGO club and they applauded after I, I presented that case because it was so insane. Later in the story, the patient who you call Mr. Jones is in the ICU and he still has this problem of the SVC syndrome and he still needs the procedure. And just to clarify, it sounds like the, the bleeding into the pericardium, that was a complication of the procedure you were doing. Is that correct? Correct. So what happened was the wire that I was using, uh, it's a glide wire and a glide wire is very slippery and it's good for getting through obstructions, but it's also well known for going outside of a blood vessel, going extra luminal. And especially in a patient with cancer, the uh, tissue planes are often not normal. So that's something that can happen. And uh, it took me a long time and I talked about it with a lot of people. And I, re I remember at Angio Club, one of the People there said that his partner did the same thing and the patient died in the room where his wire went outside the vessel and then he ballooned. And then when you put in the balloon, the balloon expands the channel where that wire went through and blood must have tracked through into around the heart. So I'm glad I recognized it. I'm not sure if the other people that had this happen, recognized it, or, or tried what I tried. Complications are going to happen, and anyone that trains with me, I always say complications, mistakes, they happen. Just recognize them, fix them. 
And we're lucky that I recognized and fixed the problem on Mr. Jones. But the story doesn't end there. You have to go back and consent him again for your second try. And he gives consent. And there's a line in your story that really stood out to me, which was, you said, after everything that happened, he still trusted me and it scared me. The fact that he trusted me and trusted me twice. Can you tell me a little bit more about that feeling of being scared when he trusted you again? So people talk about imposter syndrome a lot, and uh, I live in my body, so I know how I feel. And all the time, I think to myself, I can't believe they let me be an attending, you know? (laughs) I'm so still in that medical student, intern, resident mentality, and I've been in attending for over seven years now. I'm the chairman of this department, but somewhere inside of me, I'm like, I'm just learning this. I'm just trying to figure this out. And I have to balance that with the fact that I have done all these things and I do have all this knowledge, but there's still so much more. You know, that was a case early in my career. And it's something that did help me build the trust in myself. But I don't think I'm ever going to feel like I know enough to do this job. Even though I do know enough to do this job, I kind of hate saying this stuff out loud because I don't know if it sounds like something you want in your doctor. It's the truth. And I think it's important to talk about these things, which is why your story, in my opinion, was so powerful, one of the most powerful of the night, because of the intensity of it and the vulnerability of it and just really laying it out there for the audience. Like, what is it like to be in this business? What is it like to have your job be this high stakes video game? And I don't think most people could do that job. I couldn't do that job. I was a little bit scared of what people would say to me afterwards, especially a lot of non doctors in that room and All the non-doctors were really appreciative of the honesty of my saying that I don't know everything and sometimes we're just making it up. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for telling the story at The Nocturnist. Thanks for talking to me today. And I'm sure there are people listening who are interested in procedures and who are interested in interventional radiology or adjacent specialties like interventional pulmonology, interventional cardiology, other procedure-based careers. If you could shout out a message to those people, what would you say to them? I would say that interventional radiology is fantastic and I love it. And find me and ask me about it. As you can tell, I'm always happy to talk about interventional radiology. Awesome. Well, I will let you go because for the listeners before this conversation, Bobby was telling us about all these cases that he's dealing with. So we stole him away from his clinical work for a little while, but we'll let you get back to it, to the good work you do and the hard work you do. And thank you for the work that you do. And thanks again for being here. Thank you. This episode of The Nocturnist was produced, edited, and mixed by John Oliver. Bobby's story was coached by Jennifer Hyde and performed at The Nocturnist live show in New York City in December 2019. Our executive producer is Ali Block. Our chief operating officer is Rebecca Groves. Our communications and social media intern is Yuki Schwab. And our medical student fellow is Snehal Murthy. Our original theme music was composed by Yosef Monroe. Additional music comes from Blue Dot Sessions. Illustrations for this season of The Nocturnist are by Ashley Florial. The Nocturnist is made possible by the California Medical Association, a physician-led organization that works tirelessly to make sure that the doctor-patient relationship remains at the center of medicine. To learn more about the CMA, visit cmadocs.org. The Nocturnist is also supported by the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation and by donations from listeners like you. 
Thank you so much for supporting our work in storytelling. If you enjoy the show, please help others find us by giving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. To contribute your voice to one of our upcoming projects or to make a donation, visit our website at thenocturnist.com. I'm your host, Emily Silverman. See you next week.